Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Serious Security Seminar live from Purdue University. Uh, for those in the audience who attended our annual uh, security uh, symposium this last week, thank you for your attendance. For those who did not, there is an opportunity uh, to go online to take a look at many of the videos, the keynotes, the technical talks, the panel discussions, the fireside chats, and even the student uh, presentations uh, at that event. Uh, you can also go back to the archives and view any of our videos dating all the way back to 1999. So this week is my great pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sayek Ray. Sayek is a member of the security research staff at Intel Corporation. Uh, Intel is one of the strategic partners for, for Sirius and a long history of doing both collaborative research as well as hiring a whole lot of automakers come work with them. Sayek, welcome to Purdue. Thank you. Thank you, Joel, for the nice introduction. And thanks for having me in this seminar series. Today, I am going to discuss about pre-silicon hardware security analysis through information flow tracking, current industry applications, and research questions. Uh, please uh, let me uh, speak a little bit about my background. Uh, I am coming from an organization in Intel called Intel Product Assurance and Security. And within that organization, uh, my division is called Offensive Security Research. So we focus on cutting edge advanced threats that Intel is worried about. Uh, we look into attacks, mitigations, and tooling, all aspects related to advanced security research. And thanks to relentless research and development in this field, uh, hardware security has become a, a very important topic for all semiconductor companies, including Intel. Intel takes security very seriously. Uh, it has significant emphasis and investments in security. And our organization is chartered to look into various aspects related to advanced threats. I personally look into areas uh, including tools and automations for vulnerability detection, mitigation, and assurance, uh, both for hardware and firmware. And today I am going to discuss some of our research work related to pre-silicon hardware verification using information flow tracking. Beyond that, I also look into product security research for reconfigurable and heterogeneous computing uh, and also in data center networking. My background is in formal methods. I did my PhD from UC Berkeley and then before joining Intel, I did my postdoc from Princeton. So uh, my today's talk is going to be divided into three sections. First, I will discuss what is information flow tracking and why it is important. Uh, here, I will discuss about various abstraction levels where information flow tracking can be applied, and in particular, how we are applying that for RTL. Then I will discuss uh, its application for RTL level security why this is so important and why this is so ubiquitous. And then I will also discuss what are the advantages, why we are interested in applying it compared to the other techniques. Then in the second part, I will discuss about the current status of activity related to hardware IFT. Uh, I will discuss what are the roadblocks that researchers have overcome so far and what is the current state of the art. Then in the final section, I will discuss what is coming next. What are the roadblocks that are yet there, uh, which we want your help, the help from the research community to overcome, and um, in which areas we can expect to see some more progress. So with that, let's try to dive into IFT or information flow tracking. What is this? So. As many of you may know that this is a reasoning technique that models how information propagates as computation progress in a system. Now, uh, by system, I actually mean a lot of things because IFT can be defined and applied at various level of abstraction. For example, it can be applied for operating systems. It can be applied at programming language level. It can be applied for distributed systems, then for cloud computing, and also for hardware. Today, I am going to focus on hardware, uh, particularly pre-silicon RTL, 
but I must mention that information flow tracking, this, this subject itself actually originated in the programming language community within operating system or distributed systems community. And uh, over past few years, hardware uh, security research community has started embracing this and has been able to successfully apply it for uh, hardware verification. So the definition of information flow tracking actually changes based on the level of abstraction where you apply. Uh, the, the problem may look a little different when you look at, uh, at the level of programming language or operating system level form formulation, whereas it may look a little different uh, in, in RTL or hardware level formulation. But I must say that underneath all different abstractions, the fundamental idea has remained the same. And maybe we can go back to this Dennings model of information flow analysis, uh, which can be thought of as a precursor of all formulations at any different, any level of abstraction. And interestingly, this research was actually done at Purdue uh, in 1975. Since then, I think uh, we have been applying information flow tracking at various level of abstraction. And today I am going to talk about the current state of the art in the context of RTL. So uh, let's see what I mean when I say information flow tracking problem at RTL level. Uh, here I am showing a small circuit. Uh, this is actually a gate level circuit of a locking mechanism. Uh, this is a flip-flop, and this flip-flop is getting its input from the signal D, uh, and there is a lock signal, and the intended semantics is when this lock signal is set to 1, then this value D cannot be written to the output of this flip-flop Q. So that means this lock is indeed behaving like a lock. Once it is set, it locks this input to be flown into the output. So this, this uh, is the Verilog code snippet for this diagram. And uh, let's say this is our security requirement that we want to verify that when the lock bit is asserted, the register cannot be overwritten. Now, uh, in throughout my presentation, I will be talking about this type of RTL, uh, where the RTL is represented in a high level hardware description language like Verilog or VHDL or System Verilog. And you can imagine a get level netlist representation mentally uh, for these type of circuits. Now, if I want to verify this security requirement, then I have several options. Uh, one very traditional or classical approach is to represent this requirement in system Verilog assertion. In system Verilog assertion, the, the requirement may look like this, lock implies dollar stable Q, uh, dollar stable is a system Verilog assertion primitive which uh, specifies that the signal Q remains stable over clocks. That means uh, its value don't change. So when lock is set, its value don't change. And then I can apply various tools. For example, I can use an assertion-based simulation uh, environment to verify whether the circuit is satisfying this property. Or maybe I can use uh, a formal verification tool uh, to verify the system Verilog assertion. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, formal verification is a technique that mathematically proves that a circuit satisfies a property. And in traditional applications, um, formal verification properties are usually represented in system Verilog assertion. And then there are multiple tools that you can use to verify them. But let's see how we can capture this requirement as an information flow property. So this is a small example. So uh, you may find this formulation rather obvious. Here, what I'm specifying is I'm specifying that the source of my information is D, destination of my information is Q, and the condition is lock. So that means when lock is set, I want to see a path from source D to destination Q. Now, whether there exists a path or not, that depends on whether there is, there is a bug in the circuit or not. That means ideally in a bug-free circuit, depending on the security requirement, I should not see a path for this specification, right? Now, once I specify this IFT property, then I should be able to use uh, available tools 
to see whether this property is satisfied on this design or not. Now, in practice, uh, there are multiple applications of information flow tracking uh, to capture security requirements. As I mentioned, information flow tracking research started primarily in the software community, and then gradually it moved into hardware community. Uh, in software community, actually, it has been demonstrated that information flow tracking can be used to specify almost all popular or common uh, software security issues like buffer overflow, memory corruption, SQL injection, formatted string vulnerability, cross type scripting, malware, you name it. Similarly, in hardware security community, also, we are observing that IFT can be used to specify various security scenarios like hardware design vulnerability, insecure modes like insecure debug mode, timing channel, microarchitectural channels, uh, hardware trojans, etc. Now, I am going to spend a little bit of time to describe a few security scenario to convince you that uh, information flow tracking can be really useful to capture practical security scenarios or situations. So I have three examples for you, uh, and all three are real practical security scenarios that we are encountering a lot in, uh, like in realistic hardware designs. The first one is access control. Uh, as you know, in security, access control is a very big topic. And uh, many of the security attacks can be prevented by properly designing access control solutions. Uh, the, this is my first example, which I showed you a couple of slides ago. Uh, and you can think of these as a very basic access control system, right? Here, this lock bit is actually preventing access of this signal to the output of this, this flip-flop. Uh, and we, we have shown how we can use uh, information flow tracking to specify that I don't want to see a path from D to Q when this log bit is set. Now, a little bit more realistic example is here, which is very similar in essence uh, with respect to this one. And it is very realistic security scenario that we need to worry about a lot in practical designs. Uh, let's say the requirement is the following, that when debug mode is set, that means when debug mode is one, then this asset should not propagate to the output. Uh, some arbitrary value, let's say all zero must be propagated to the output. So you can see a similarity between this and this. So um, I'm pretty sure you can quickly come up with an information flow specification for this requirement. And the specification should say that when debug mode is set to one, uh, and this, if this asset is a source, then I don't want to see a path from this source to this destination. Another uh, access control situation is uh, this NOC or, or network on chip. As you know, network on chip connects uh, various source of information to target of information. Uh, for example, here, A is an IP, which is an initiator of a transaction, and let's say D is a target of a transaction. Now, this NOC provides a connectivity matrix. That means NOC connects some initiator IP to some target IP, uh, and the connectivity matrix depends on the architecture of the product. Now, once the architect specifies the necessary connections, uh, the designer has to design the NOC accordingly. And then the verification engineer has to verify that the design is actually uh, satisfying the architectural requirement. That means whatever is specified in the connectivity matrix uh, that is actually implemented in the design. So for example, if the security architect wants that this uh, initiator IPA should be connected to this um, target IPE, that means there must exist a path from A to E. Uh, the architect may, may not want to have a path from this initi initiator IPC to this target IPF, right? So then it is uh, the task of the verification engineer to, to verify that on the implementation, uh, whether there exists indeed a path from A to E, and also there is no path from C to F. And information flow tracking comes to rescue for this type of application because there is a very natural uh, cap encoding of this requirement 
uh, which says that, okay, if A is my source, I want to see a path to destination E. And if C is my source, I don't want to see a path to destination F. The second example that I have today is a, a problem called confused deputy. And this is also a very important problem in, uh, in hardware security, where this, this is a kind of a schematic representation of an SOC. And here I am showing multiple blocks and there are paths between many, many such blocks. In just in the previous uh, slide, we saw the example of an, an NOC. Similarly, here we have uh, an NOC-like interconnect, and this is also connecting various IPs. Now, the security requirement may be so that I don't want to have a path from this third-party component to this temperature sensor, right? Uh, it could be detrimental for my system security. Now, um, just looking at the design, I may be able to see that this knock actually guarantees that there is no connection between this, this IP, this third party IP to this temperature sensor. But this, this absence of this direct path may not be enough to preclude any indirect path. For example, here in the diagram, I have shown an indirect path uh, which goes from this third party IP to some other component, let's say to this graphics core, uh, through this interconnect. And then again, through the interconnect, these graphics can talk to this temperature sensor, right? And then this third party component may be able to use this graphics code as a confused deputy to access this temperature sensor. Now, if I specify the IFT requirement that I don't want to see any path uh, from this third party component to this temperature sensor, then depending on the tool that you are using, you may be able to prove that indeed there is no path from this third party IP to the temperature sensor, or if there exists such a path, for example, if there exists such a red path, it should be able to show you that indeed there is a path and you need to take necessary measure to block that path. And then uh, the, the third and final example that I have is a stale data. Uh, this is another problem that we are encountering in, in hardware security, uh, where we have some registers or some memory elements sitting on our hardware, uh, which may have some data which came to that uh, storage element as part of some previous computation. And then later on, it may propagate to some, some attacker or some output interface, which is potentially untrusted. Now, the problem is if that memory element stored some data which is sensitive in nature or which was sensitive in the previous context, now it may flow to the output and uh, a potentially mal malicious actor can read it out. Uh, one example is, let's say, clock gating, right? Clock gating is a power optimization feature which we all are aware of. And this is a very useful feature for power optimization. But typically what happens in, in during clock gating, uh, we, we kind of block clock to certain register because we know that that computation is not needed so that that register does not toggle. But from security standpoint, uh, maybe that register now contains some, some uh, value or some data, uh, which because it did not toggle, it was not overwritten. And now that data may leak out to the output interface to some potentially malicious actor then uh, we need to verify that no such data leaking is happening. Uh, even if uh, some register is holding some stale data, the data is actually not leaked to some untrusted actor. And for that, you can imagine that you are using information flow tracking to, to specify that stale data buffer as a source of information and the untrusted output uh, channel or pins as the destination of your information. And then you can pose this as an information flow tracking problem. To generalize what we have discussed so far, why is information flow tracking problem um, or, or information flow tracking formulation so successful in capturing security requirements? Uh, we can actually refer to this information security triad uh, which says that most of our security requirements can be divided into three types, right? It is called CIA triad. Uh, C stands for confidentiality, I stands for integrity, and A stands for availability. Now, 
uh, throughout the examples uh, that I just discussed, you might have noticed that uh, the examples can be partitioned into either confidentiality or integrity bucket. Um, here I have two abstract diagrams. Uh, here, uh, let's say the confidentiality is represented with a crypto key. And uh, when, he, when we want to specify a confidentiality requirement, uh, we say that, okay, that crypto key should not be read out um, by some untrusted actor. And by integrity, we specify that the crypto key should not be overwritten by some untrusted actor, right? And um, uh, then we can very easily use these IFT properties to capture confidentiality and integrity requirements. Similarly, uh, we can also use this IFT uh, to capture this availability requirement. For example, you have a temperature sensor register, which is supposed to contain the value of the temperature threshold. That means if that value is crossed, then some thermal tripping has to happen or something like that. Now that value is of importance for proper functioning of the platform, because if some malicious actor changes that threshold, uh, in such a way that proper tripping is not happening within the safe temperature, then the platform can suffer through this DOS or PDOS situation, right? And we need to make sure that no untrusted actor can actually write to that register. So the way I described uh, integrity property uh, as a application area for IFT, with the same essence, we can use IFT to specify availability requirements as well. So the point is IFT can be actually used to specify all types of confidentiality, integrity, and availability properties, like all of these three, uh, three elements of this information security triad. And that is why IFT is so popular and so effective in specifying the security requirements. Uh, just to outline how popular IFT has become in specifying requirements, um, I would like to refer you to this uh, website called Hardware CWE website. Hardware CWE is a common taxonomy uh, which the semiconductor industry is now converging to. Uh, this, this effort is um, you know, spearheaded by uh, MITRE.org and all major semiconductor companies including Intel are contributing to this effort to come up with a standard taxonomy for hardware weaknesses. CWE stands for Common Weakness Enumeration. And uh, here, the idea is to come up with all types of weaknesses that can be observed in, in hardware, both in pre-silicon as well as in silicon. Uh, and um, here I have shown the, uh, the main buckets of the hardware weaknesses, and each bucket has many sub-buckets. For example, here I have expanded the privilege separation and access control issue, which is a uh, big bucket and under that we have multiple uh, subcategories of weaknesses uh, similarly other buckets have their subcategories now the point is for all these cwes uh, we are making an observation that many of them if not majority of them can be actually represented using ift so here i have shown a, a recent study uh, this white paper is available in the internet uh, this recent study is actually showing uh, which of these CWEs are conducive to IFT style specification. So far, I have discussed um, what are the different types of properties can be specified using IFT, right? Now let's talk a little bit about the verification um, and ease of verification. Why IFT uh, is so effective, not only for specifying, but also for verifying the properties. Uh, what are the advantages of this specification? So I would like to call out four points. Uh, first of all, many security properties are amenable to IFT specification. This is what we just discussed. Then the specification language itself is very simple right? Uh, you need to specify the source, you need to specify the destination, and maybe you need to specify some conditions. So it does not have any learning curve. You don't have to learn the syntax of the language. Different tools have their own syntax, but um, um, almost all of them are very simple. And um, it actually follows this source destination and some condition uh, structure. Maybe the actual syntax differ from tool to tool, but the basic idea remains the same. 
um, it is not as complex as a language like system memory log assertion. Then uh, another big advantage is you don't have to understand the detailed inner working of the circuit that you are verifying. Oftentimes, when we write system value log assertions, we need to understand the actual timing semantics of the circuit, actual clock by clock behavior, so that we can capture the requirement in SVA. Uh, but the benefit of IFT is you don't have to worry too much about the inner working because you just specify the source and the destination, which are the two interface signals. And maybe in order to specify the condition, you have to understand the signals and their behavior a little bit. But in most of the times, what we have observed that these conditions are rather simple. And typically, you don't have to worry about the inner working of the circuit. And this is very important for big industrial circuits because these circuits are very complex. Uh, it is very difficult to understand what is happening for, for such big circuits. And for a verification engineer, who is coming to verify the circuit, maybe he or she is not the designer or they don't get a chance to talk to the designer, then it becomes very difficult for the verification engineer to understand what is going on, right? And that is why for verification engineers, it is a lot easier to write down the IFT property uh, without worrying too much about the internal details. And um, it, it has another benefit uh, of portability. So suppose um, some of the internal part of the circuit goes through some changes, right? So mm, mm, uh, um, in, the, in the next generation, you need to do some optimization or you need to change some feature of the circuit. But uh, since the IFT properties are specified based on the interface signals uh, being treated as source and destination signals, uh, you don't have to worry too much about what has changed inside the circuit, right? Uh, most likely your condition signals will not be affected with those optimizations. Uh, in that case, your specification can remain exactly the same, right? And this is a big benefit for big circuits. And finally, uh, we have seen that the environment that we typically have to construct for any verification experiment, we call it verification harness. We have seen that due to simplicity of the property specification, oftentimes the environment creation overhead is also relatively less for IFT uh, type properties. So for these benefits, IFT is gaining a lot of momentum, a lot of attention from the validation community. First of all, it is easy to specify and capture security requirements, and then to run the verification tools and to maintain the, the, the proof collaterals, IFT has significant advantage over traditional verification. So the bottom line is then if your security requirement is amenable to IFT specification, go for it. Now let's try to understand what is the current state of the art in terms of verifying these IFT properties. Um, how do these tools work? So, uh, Let's start with a baseline formulation here. So again, this is the same uh, toy example, uh, which is showing that this lock bit is uh, supposed to prevent uh, this signal D to propagate from this point to this point. Now the question is how we can verify it. There are multiple formulations uh, to verify these requirements. And here I have shown one popular formulation where we actually create two copies of the circuit. So this is copy one and copy two. And then we, we join the output of interest here. Let's say if is my output of interest, uh, I want to verify whether this secret has some influence on F or not. So in that case, I will join the output F with F prime with an exclusive or get. And then I ask this question that when the non-secret inputs don't change, uh, can f be equal to f prime? I am letting secret input to change. So if you look at this formulation carefully, you will see that secret input can change. So here I have secret and here I have secret prime, but the non-secret inputs remain the same. Under this formulation, uh, if we see that there is a change, that means if we see a, a one is being um, uh, derived here, that means there exists an input pattern under which f and f prime differs. Now, since non-secret input has remained the same, 
and secret can change only. That means a change in secret value can actually induce a change in the output value F. And this is something that we don't want to see under a secure situation. Because under a secure situation, we don't want to see that secret is influencing the output. Because in that case, looking at the output, I may be able to tell what the secret was. So, uh, so here, this diagram actually demonstrates that if I want to verify this security requirement, remember, uh, I wanted to verify that when lock is set, Q, D cannot propagate to Q. Um, in this essence, I need to copy these two circuit. And then other than D, I need to kind of tie all the inputs together in this fashion. And then I will leave D as a floating input. As you can see here, D is getting input from this pin and D prime, which is the D variable in the copy circuit is getting the input from this pin. And then I join the output with this exclusive OR gate and then ask this question that does there exist a valuation to the inputs under which output of this circuit will differ from output of this circuit. Now, uh, in, in the last slide, I have shown a very simple example just to illustrate the idea. But in practice, we have more complex circuits. We have CPUs or SOCs. Uh, and here I am showing how to apply this idea of this um, uh, copying the circuit and then joining the output with XOR gates. Uh, and I'm applying this idea to CPUs. Uh, here you see that uh, the secret uh, input is kind of kept open. It can take any value. And then the other memory elements, which are not secret, I'm tying them together. And then I'm asking the same question on the outputs. And typically, all these interesting circuits are sequential circuits. And in order to apply this idea for sequential circuits, uh, most of the time, I need to unroll the circuit uh, and then apply some SAT solver. So I'm not going into the details because these are more traditional ideas borrowed from traditional functional uh, verification or, or model checking for functional verification. You might have heard the term bounded model checking. Here precisely I am applying bounded model checking on this MITRE circuit or on this equivalence checking circuit. Now, why I am doing this? Why I am uh, copying the circuit and then joining the output with exclusive OR and do, doing all these tricks? The reason being, uh, these type of information flow tracking properties are actually not simple trace properties. Rather, they belong to a family of properties called hyper properties. And uh, I'm not again going into the technical details of hyper properties. Uh, please refer to this paper. This is a seminal paper in this field, which is demonstrating that in order to verify hyper properties, you cannot use a verifier that can be used to verify trace properties. You need to do something else. And this something else for IFT style properties is this creating a copy uh, of the circuit and then you know, verify the output. Uh, which comes after this exclusive word gate. And this is this type of verification is called two safety verification. Uh, basically, I am verifying a safety property uh, by creating two copies of the system. Now, the general theory of hyper property says that you may have to create k copies of the system. k is an arbitrary number greater than one. Uh, but for most of our, our IFT applications, we are observing that two safety is enough. Now, this paper from Professor Alex Iken talks about how uh, this, this security requirements can be captured as two safety properties. Again, I'm not going into the details, uh, but uh, the point here is uh, I am creating two copies of the system. And the reason here is I want to compare between various traces of the system, right? So I want to compare between two traces of the system, and that is why I am creating two copies. So based on this formulation, uh, there have been many tools uh, which are out there, uh, both coming from academia as well as from industry, like commercial EDA vendors. They have tools to verify IFT properties. Um, uh, the open tools that are available in public domain, um, I, I have cited a couple of them. Uh, for formal tools, that means which work based on formal verification, 
Um, that means this mathematical exhaustive proof that a counter example uh, does not exist. Uh, we have a tool called VOS2, uh, which approaches this IFT problem uh, from this formal perspective. Whereas the counterpart is runtime tools, uh, which do not offer any mathematical proof for absence of a counter example, uh, but it can drive some test vectors and see whether any of the um, IFT properties have been violated or not. So there are these runtime tools, uh, one coming from ETH Zurich, which I have cited here. So this is the current state of the art. All these tools are quite useful and we regularly use them um, on, on uh, our designs. Uh, so then what is going on in the research directions, right? So uh, here I, I have uh, cited one paper uh, which discusses one recent research result which shows how we can improve the formulation that I have just shown. That means this uh, MITRE construction, taking two copies of the circuit, joining them together with an exclusive or uh, gate, and then maybe calling a bounded model checker. Uh, can we do better? How can we speed up this process? So in, in this paper, um, we are actually showing that uh, you can actually improve on top of this basic bounded model checking formulation. And this paper is providing an inductive formulation, which is showing how we can incrementally make progress even for a big complex designs. So this paper actually shows this on uh, various RISC-V processors, for example, rocket ship, Ariana, uh, boom, these are the um, uh, risk five processors on which we did the experiment. I will encourage you to go through the details of the paper if you are interested to understand how this algorithm works. But I would like to call out the, the main principle that we leveraged here in this paper, and that is based on, in, on an induction principle, uh, which is called leakage alert and propagation alert. So let me try to explain this with the help of this diagram. So let's say uh, this blue uh, blue bubble is the state which the attacker or the adversary can observe. And all these green bubbles are the states which attacker cannot observe. Uh, in a more formal term, this blue bubble is an architectural state, a program visible state, whereas these green bubbles are microarchitectural states, which are out there uh, to facilitate the actual computation, uh, but it is not program visible. That means attacker cannot see it, right? Now, uh, if information propagates and ends up to this observable architectural state, then game is already over, right? So attacker can actually see the information. Now, in order to propagate to this blue state, it has to go through a lot of green states. That means a lot of microarchitectural states, right? So if you think in terms of clock cycles, then you will see that at one clock cycle, information has propagated from this point to this point. And then in the next clock cycle, information has propagated to this microarchitectural state to an architectural state. So that means whenever there is a path to an architectural state that must have crossed through many microarchitectural states. The basic idea that this paper uh, is kind of uh, propagating is, uh, can we actually track those microarchitectural states? And the answer is yes, we can track those microarchitectural states in an inductive formulation. And that means if there exists a path that will be discovered through this formulation. And if there exists no such path, that means if there is a barrier like this, uh, here I have shown with these dotted arrows that these transitions don't exist, then that means when you are in this frontier, you will see that information is not propagating to any other state in the next clock cycle, right? And that makes this proof so efficient because now you can prove in one clock cycle that information is not propagating to any next state, including any architectural state. So this observation actually helps us to speed up on the basic bounded model checking formulation. And uh, the experimental result demonstrates that we can use this technique to verify this type of uh, IFT properties uh, for many processors. Um, there are the, in, in our experimental suit, we have uh, both in order processor and out of order processor. Uh, for in order processor, uh, we are showing that these, this proof technique can work as is. 
Whereas for out of order processors, which are a, a bit more complex in, in their design, uh, we need something more. We need some invariants to begin with to speed up the verification process. Uh, in this context, these invariants are called microequivalents. I'm not going into those details, but uh, please refer to the paper if you are interested. So then uh, let us quickly discuss uh, what next. That means so far we have discussed about this IFT specification, um, some formulation, how to verify those IFT properties and some ideas how to speed up the, the kind of basic formulation and uh, how to scale it up for big designs. Now let's discuss what's next and where uh, we are seeing more research problems where you can help. So uh, first of all, uh, even though it is easy to write these IFT properties, uh, it, is, it is not easy to scale on big designs. Uh, I have discussed just one idea, uh, but the real designs are very challenging. So I think we need many such smart ideas. Uh, we need more uh, inductive strengthening ideas and uh, more way of capturing the initial state with invariants. Uh, there could be some different level of abstraction as well where we can specify these IFT properties. Um, I have cited one such paper, which is a recent paper, which demonstrate that instead of solving IFT at, the, at a bit level, uh, you can kind of formulate this problem at this macro cell level, like at the level of adders or multipliers, and that can give you some speed up. Then the second problem area is property generation. So I discussed that it is intuitive to write these IFT properties, but then where we can find the security properties, who are going to give us the security requirements? Today, uh, we actually uh, depend on the security architects to give us the security requirements. But the question is, can we do something better? Can we generate these requirements automatically? In a recent paper, we are showing that this is a promising area uh, we can actually generate uh, these properties automatically for some applications, but then the question is how we can generalize it, how far we can go. And then finally, uh, I would like to call out this inductive formulation that I just described in my last slide. Uh, I would like to call out that as a very promising technique to reason about architecture level security requirements. So at the architecture level, the security architect may have designed some block uh, which shows that um, this will protect information propagation, right? Uh, then typically we deploy these information flow tools and, uh, and the, the available verification methodologies at the very end level. That means when the design has happened, the RTL is now available and then we apply the verification tools. But it could be very late, right? Uh, by then, a lot of details have been added to the design. The design has grown in size. So verification becomes very challenging. Uh, it is not always scalable. We need to consider many, many corner cases. But at the architecture level, uh, we have a very clean view of the design. And at that level, if we can specify some requirement, and if that requirement can be verified uh, with this inductive methodology that I just described, then can we actually define a methodology where we don't have to wait all the way to the RTL to be available? Can we push this requirement to the gradual refinement process from architecture to RTL? And at every refinement level, we get a proof. I think this is an interesting area. We don't have a viable methodology yet, but maybe this is open for uh, subsequent research. So uh, with this, I would like to conclude. And um, here are my collaborators. Um, I presented uh, my joint work with a lot of Intel as well as academic collaborators. So here are the names. Um, some of you, you may know already. Uh, if you need to contact them, please let me know. So to summarize, uh, I have discussed what is IFT, why this is important, and why this is so popular and gaining momentum. Then what is the current state of the art, uh, where we are, um, what was the roadblock, which of them um, have been solved already. And then I also discuss what are the next challenges uh, where uh, we want to see more research coming from you and we are pushing the uh, boundary here. With that, I would like to thank the audience and I'm ready to answer your questions.
Great. Thank you, Sayak. Um, yeah, viewers, if you uh, have questions, go ahead and use the Q&A button. Okay, it looks like we have one. Um, so Stephen asks, when will this capability be implemented in the Intel processors? So I guess uh, you are asking that when this, uh, this IFT will be used to verify Intel processors. Is this correct? Yeah, I believe that's what... what the... Yeah, so we are actually actively using IFT to verify various security requirements. Okay, I don't see any more questions here, but uh, Sayak, oh, we did get one more here. Let me read it to you. Uh, security servers. Uh, yeah, so Stephen's asking, like, you know, what kinds of CPUs will that be in? And security servers like SP, uh, Xeon, mm -hmm. uh, Fortune. Yeah, so um, we actually apply these verification methodologies for components, right? So we, we don't verify. Um, server as like one big monolithic SOC or monolithic semiconductor. So now we verify uh, or we work on individual IPs which go to many different end products. So I think to answer your question, um, I'm sure we have worked on some IPs which go which has gone to this server. Uh, but uh, when we apply these tools, we actually work in a much lower level. Great. Well, well, Sayak, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, oh, uh, I guess uh, Stephen's asking about cloud and endpoints. So yeah, I think uh, let's take a step back. Uh, the the methodology or the specification formalism that I described is applicable to any hardware, right? In principle, it can be applied to any piece of hardware, uh, irrespective of its size or irrespective of its end application. So you just design a circuit, let's say you using Verilog or VHDL or system Verilog, you have designed some circuit and then the methodology that I described can be applied to that piece of code. So that way, the methodology that we discussed is agnostic to the end product. And in that sense, uh, whatever uh, component that we are verifying, it can go to any product, for example, uh, as you mentioned, all these products, right? So like server or cloud or endpoint, it doesn't matter. And then uh, Stephen asks, uh, can you put the POCs at Intel um, back up on the screen? Do you have that slide? So uh, which slide did you mean? Um, this one? Uh, oh, the, the people you're working with at Intel. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
I, I recognize one of those names, uh, Pri Priyam Biswas. I think he attended Purdue here. That's true. Yes. From yeah. Purdue. Actually, that's yeah, she's my teammate now. Yes, sure. Yes. She's uh, she's one of our serious uh, affiliated students. Mm -hmm. Great. Cool. Okay. Well, Sayak, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, we, um, you know, appreciate you giving this talk today. So uh, viewers, uh, we'll be back again next week, Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Um, for uh, another weekly seminar series. So thank you very much, Sayak. Take care. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.